Well, hey there, freaks. I hope all is well. It's your boy Marty here doing a little uh, pre-episode recording to introduce our sponsors. Uh, before I get into our sponsors, a little bit about today's episode. It's been a while since I hopped in the studio for a face-to-face, long-form conversation. I uh, so very excited for this one. Sat down with Alan Silbert uh, from INX uh, in Maryland, and uh, we had a really cool conversation. He's been around for a while. Uh, I've been a fan of his on Twitter for for a bit, and and we just talked about the old days and and some other stuff pertaining to Bitcoin. Um, but before we get into the interview, I'd like to thank our sponsors. First sponsor today uh, is the Cash App. You already know the Cash App is the number one finance app in the App Store. What you might not know is that you can also p- put Cash App in your wallet with the Cash Card. I've talked about this before. The Cash Card, you can customize it, write your name on it, signature. You can put Bitcoin on it. You can uh, you can do whatever you want, basically, in a little area in the bottom right-hand corner of the front of the card. Uh, and this card enables you to use uh, the Boost program, which is on the app. And this gets you incredible deals at real ta- retailers like Whole Foods, Shake Shack, Chipotle, uh, coffee shops. Dollar off any coffee shop you go to. It's an incredible program. I've used it literally, literally 15 minutes ago. And then before that, 12 hours, 12 hours ago at Whole Foods and the coffee shop around the corner. Saving money uh, with the Cash App many times a day. Highly recommended. Uh, The Cash Card puts you in control of your money with extra in-app safety features that let you pause your card with a touch, leave your card in an Uber, swipe, uh, swipe, uh, can't use my card on the app, and and you're good. Nobody's going to be stealing your money or your Bitcoins. Thank God. Actually, they wouldn't be able to do that anyway. That's besides the point. Unlike a credit card, there are no fees ever, and credit check isn't required to get one. I'm not using the other apps anymore. Neither are my friends, my family. Uh, Turn everybody into Cash Cash App Mafia. It's been pretty cool. So visit the App Store Google Play Market to download the Cash App now and get your free cash card today. Uh, As always, thank you to Cash App for sponsoring the pod, my favorite place to buy Bitcoin right now. And then our second sponsor, I'm going to back... Got them back in the sponsor spot uh, is Honeyminer. Honeyminer, they actually want you to go check out their their Twitter page at Get Honeyminer. Uh, they're doing a GPU uh, giveaway right now, so head over to to the Honeyminer Twitter page and and get in that race to get some free GPUs. It's pretty cool. We'll help you, especially if you're looking to experiment with mining and are interested to see how mining works in particular. Uh, this may be your chance to get in for free. GPU, mine some shit coins, liquidate them to Bitcoin. Uh, so definitely go check out Honeyminer. Uh, and if you don't know about Honeyminer already, it is the one click stop to earning Bitcoin right away. Basically, you go to honeyminer.com, uh, download their software. I believe it's only for Windows right now. They are uh, expanding into Linux and iOS, or excuse me, Mac OS soon. Um, and uh basically what you do is you download their software turn it on let your computer uh mine shit coins contribute to a pool that is mining the most profitable uh altcoin chain at a certain point in time and you get bitcoin in your account that you can then send to a pro- uh a cold storage solution so definitely check out honey, honey miner hop in that gpu giveaway today uh, on their Twitter page, and I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Alan. Pew. Tales from the Crypt. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here for an interview for the first time in a while. I feel like it's been since my interview at Caitlin Long, where I really sat down and had like a face-to-face in-depth conversation with somebody. So I'm very excited. I think you freaks are going to be excited to speak with this guest. I don't think I've ever heard you on a podcast before, so I think this is a rare pod get here. Uh, I want to introduce you freaks to Alan Silbert. Alan, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming on. So for you freaks that don't know, uh, Alan is Executive Managing Director, is that correct? Mm-hmm. At INX, which is a crypto exchange and derivatives company building a bridge between crypto and institutional clients. Formerly uh, co-founder of BitPremier, where you wanted to buy your Lambos or your houses with Bitcoin. But, uh, can you still do it now? Is this still around? Or no, 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 no not anymore. sadly, yeah, it went by the wayside. Ahead yeah. of its time. 
And before that, you were at Capital One, correct? Yeah, Capital One, so G mid- Capital, yeah. Middle market debt? Yep, yep. Um, this is how we start off with Tales from the Crypt. How the hell did you get into Bitcoin? So, um, my brother introduced me to Bitcoin, I think it was late 2012, early 2013. Um, I think I think Barry came across it in 2012, and then... You know, it's the, it's the same story that you hear from everybody. You know, he first came and told me about it. This is amazing or whatever. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. It's internet money. You know, you know. It's, it's, I just, I kind of took a pass, um, kind of ignored his emails for a while. Um, you know, I can remember one specific, I was, I was on a ski trip, I think, in Utah. And I can remember him texting me and calling me like, you're watching this. It's like, it's like eight bucks, nine bucks, 10 bucks. I was like, all right, I guess I better take a look. And, you know, I'll finally delve in and see what, see what it's about. So, uh, you know, started, started diving in and, uh, you know, went through the same process everybody does of, you know, denial and that, you know, this is bullshit. The government's going to shut down. You know, you, you start throwing everything you can at it, and then everybody kind of comes to this light bulb moment where you're like, holy shit, like, whatever you throw at it, like, there really is a defense for it, you know, mm-hmm. because of the decentralization or the incentives lining up or, um, you know, or, or the immutability or something. And, you know, and then the light bulb went off and, you know, it was all over. And, uh, um, you know, I was in my traditional life job of uh banking and was never very exciting to me um did since 1996 and yeah bitcoin took over kind of more and more of my my life and uh my daily and nightly thoughts and um yeah so that's kind of how we started that's one thing that's common as ex-finance guys it was just like we're sitting had a job that we didn't like. At least, I mean, I was only there for three years. Um, but I viscerally, I got like visceral, like f- hatred feelings in the cube some days. Like people walking by, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I actually quit my finance job on my birthday because nobody said happy birthday to me. <laughs> um, at the same time, I had that burning Bitcoin passion as well. Like, do you think there is something about Bitcoin that's just like draws this type of person? Obviously, is uh this is one thing I've been thinking on more is like Bitcoin is like a mission and almost like a call to action. And it's feeling more so that way, especially in the bear market. I don't know if we're getting too preachy here, but um. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I was in like commercial banking and yeah, it's just the more, you know, we're not traditionally taught like how money works. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a big, this is a big pet peeve of mine. You know, you're not in school. You're not taught how money works. You're not taught how to handle money. You know, they don't really delve into fractional reserve banking or, you know, how money just kind of arrives out of thin air. Um, and I don't know, you just, you know, more and more years in banking, you just realize that, you know, the system is so antiquated. It's such bullshit. There's so many parties that are immersed, uh, you know, that are kind of dug in that make their their money out of, you know, being one of the many county counterparties in the system. And um yeah, it just gets frustrating when you're when you're around it for a while, and, um, and you know, my in the office at the bank, it's like every every single millennial in the office is like, you know, they used to all come in and be like, you know, I heard the, about this BitConnect thing, like, you know, should we get into it, like, you know, <laughs> you know, like Brendan over there is making like one percent a day, you know, this every day it was something like that. So it's, I mean, it, all the millennials and everything are totally, you know, interested, and in, probably a little less so than late last year when. You know, when the man's going freaking nuts, but a big in Barstool's office story that was uh was a sight to be seen. I was there trying to uh bring bring some peace to the chaos. They were all buying Tron, Ripple, Neo, Cardano, name it name it, they were buying it, everything except for Bitcoin. Actually probably a good decision in that particular month because Bitcoin was above like ten thousand dollars for like thirty days and has subsequently fallen, obviously, but it's funny uh, those type of environments where the uh, where they get the shitcoin fever. I mean, that happened to me in like 2013. So did did you have that problem at all when you first got in? Was Barry like a Bitcoin maximalist and described it to you in that way, or were you like open to to all coins and did you fall for that at all? In the beginning? Yeah, I mean, I've always I've one of my favorite things about Bitcoin really is that um, you know 
and part of the reason why I I kind of always bat, default to the, the core developer team and the infrastructure is that like I believe um, that is money. It really it has to have the confidence of of people. Mm-hmm. So um, I just think that's a a main foundation of money. So. And I believe you like you need the infrastructure, you need all the investment dollars, you need the mining infrastructure, although I wish it was more decentralized. Um, so I, I've and Bitcoin is such a first place position, like there's it's so ingrained with, with you know, such a first starter advantage and so much money behind it. And I don't know, I just I never got very interested. I, you know, I del- I dabbled in some other shit coins and stuff here and there, but mm-hmm. um. Yeah, I really, I think uh, one of the most important things is really just the the infrastructure, the confidence. You know, it's ninety nine point nine percent uptime. It's um, you know, so that's kind of why I always stuck with it. Yeah, and it seems like the in- infrastructure in particular. I mean, this week huge news for infrastructure. Fidelity is announced me yesterday, um, and then last like so there's infrastructure, multiple layers, and then last week Gotenna and the Samurai guys showing that we can do transactions via MeshNet. Be a yeah, network. I, I saw that. That's that adds to the infrastructure in a different way. Um, probably not making it too much more robust, but it is just like another fail safe if you're in an area that yeah, loses. there's freaking zombie apocalypse, <laughs> right? Like, you know, the grid goes down. I know nothing about Gotenna. Do you have you bought a Gotenna yet? I, I, I see yet. people I th- are buying Gotennas now. Not yet. My uh, co-host of a weekly show, I do a rabbit hole rehab recap matt odell he he's a big go tenor freak and he's got like eight of them and uh but he brought one over to my apartment the other night was showing me um actually gonna have the ceo of go tenor come on soon oh really next oh, couple cool. weeks. they're in brooklyn they're not uh oh really yeah they're based out of brooklyn so All they're right. right around the corner let's look into it yeah um it seems like a cool idea though mesh networks is really something i've never dove into but uh the idea i mean you see it now we have uh, obviously the internet uh mesh network satellites Maybe if Nick Zabo and Elaine Yu come out with what they're thinking of doing, like short, short, short radio waves out the ionosphere, maybe we'll have like four ways of relaying trans- transactions soon. What yeah, you, hey, it all helps. Yeah, to the redundancy of the network and everything. So. You got open totally. dime, open dime, and uh, mm-hmm. other options as well. So it's just getting more robust. Um, and I imagine this is the type of products you're working on in INX too. You guys are working on more secondary market stuff, correct? Or... Yeah. So we, um, we took a bunch of people from the traditional finance world that just know how to talk to regulators and, and just, uh, know how institutions, uh, get comfortable with an exchange. And you know, so we're trying to bring regulated exchange to the U S market. Um, uh, I can't get too much into the, the token aspect of it, but we did we did submit a prospectus to the SEC back in January, which is a full full you know two hundred page prospectus uh, token that would get uh, marketed to the general public. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, so that's going through the process. I uh, can't talk a ton about that, but um, but yeah, I mean, you know, in general, trying to regulate an exchange to list uh, Bitcoin and some of the top coins and security tokens. Um, you know, we built an awesome team of people from the traditional world, uh, formerly from NASDAQ and Ameritrade and TMX Group and a, a bunch of advisors that are well known in the crypto space. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, we're, uh, you yeah, know, we're on our treacherous regulatory journey with the SEC and FINRA and some other regulators. And, yeah. What's that journey been like? How arduous has it been? I mean, yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's just... You know the U.S. is tough. It just it's yeah. just nonsensical. You have you have federal laws. You have you know fifty states and three I think three territories to deal with if you if you want to go all in and um, you know it's just grueling and you know you can't it's you can't do it for cheap and um, you know the, the SEC is uh, has actually been uh, it's been a pretty positive experience actually okay. dealing with the SEC so far so. I think in general they they want to create an infrastructure, a regulated infrastructure, because otherwise people will go overseas or they'll do things the wrong way. Um, but I think you know, as far as like ICOs in this country, they're pretty much you know dead. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, I think at this point you either you know <clears throat> you have to either be a security token and go the route that we're going and take on the regulators you know full steam ahead. You have to go to another jurisdiction overseas somewhere where it's friendlier, or you have to somehow say you're a utility token, not a security, which is 
<laughs> which is you know just a precarious place to be in and yeah so um and uh a lot of people relied on like legal opinion letters and stuff over the last 12 24 months and now they're you know scurrying back to their attorneys to to figure out what to do next after the subpoenas went out there yeah a yeah lot of subpoenas that went out recently i don't think that's gonna yeah it's probably not gonna stop anytime soon i'm i'm sure no that was uh what's uh most interesting what was it um one broker that uh that exchange that was allowing people to trade equities with bitcoin and uh the or the SC, i don't know if it was the fbi or sec agent who bought their first security on one broker did it in like the middle of 2016 and they just shut down and seized the site like two weeks ago so that took two years a year and a half yeah yeah i saw that um yeah i i had a, I had a visit from the government back in the in the bit premiere days <laughs> yeah so let's jump into bit premiere <laughs> so what was it like starting Bit so what was the idea behind it like how easy was it was it easy so uh you know after i went down the rabbit hole and you know speaking to my brother and you know and he was like yeah you have to get into the space and do something um we decided there wasn't a luxury marketplace so we're like all right let's, let's do let's give this a try um so i mean really the whole bit premiere was just me i, I basically handled it in like my spare time um, you know, it was like I had my day job and then I had my night job and, you know, my day job kind of, you know, I got less and less of my attention <laughs> uh, to, to my boss's dismay. Um, so, you know, yeah, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, listings kind of constantly poured in, uh, but it's, you know, it just, it was kind of ahead of its time. I think, uh, you know, people, first of all, they didn't really want a middleman involved with with these kind of purchases. They just want to deal with it themselves head on. Um, you know, two, there's just always the risk of, you know, um, they're going to somehow f end up in some regulator's queue somewhere, you know, or, or FinCEN or something. Um, and, you know, and there's just people that were all hodling and, you know, the, 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 not many purchases like went through really. So... And, if, and there was a, a ton of volume of email traffic and everything, um, which just not much ever converted. I, mm -hmm. You know, we did like a, a villa in Bali was like the big thing that happened. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It was like 700K, right? Yeah. Right? You know, that was like in the Wall Street Journal. That, that <laughs> was like, you know, that, that was the apex of bit premier fame. Um, you know, it was, it was an early Bitcoin adopter as well. Like the first five guys in Bitcoin um, who, who was the buyer. Um yeah, so you know, so I was doing my spare time. I got—I forget how they contacted me. I think it was an email, um, Homeland Security. Like, it's, I got like some random communication from them, and they were like, "Hey, uh, we'd like to come up to you know to your office and and meet you and just have, you know chat for a few minutes." So how scared were you? So when I, you know, so I was and. Uh, I forget. I forget the email. It, it wasn't like anything like scary at the time, but I was like, you know, I'm not going to be one to say say no to Homeland Security. So I was like, I guess I'll meet them for coffee. So, um, you know, and then when when they call you, it's totally freaky. Like your phone says like United States, and the phone number is like zero 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 zero. Really? You know, it's like so. Um, so I met them for coffee. It was like three guys. It was like good cop, bad cop, and then like a guy that had like a deck that they presented to me with like what they were doing um, with enforcing, you know, money laundering and stuff in the Bitcoin space. They were focused on local Bitcoins. Um, and then they brought a bit premiere and they were like, yeah, by the way, like, yeah, we saw this villa. Uh, you sold this villa and, you know, you have to do this, this, this and this. And, you know, I was trying to play above board with bit premiere and i was licensed with fins uh you know registered with fincen as a money services business and but um you know they were like you know you should have brought this to our attention this and this um so they're like you know going forward just keep an eye out for us and you know let us know if you see anything uh, you know it's not above board and interesting and, and uh you know they're like here's some pamphlets <laughs> and, and uh I think at the time they were going around from bit, from business to business, and you basically like help you know, you help us out, help, our help us do our jobs. Yeah. So anyway, so I was like, yep, yeah, sure, I'll, yeah, I'll 
help yeah you know i just you know, said whatever would make them happy that was the end of that and then um you know bit premier had you know i was working capital one at the time bit premier had our bank accounts at capital one and within like 24 hours they called capital one and they were like by the way one of your employees is running a bitcoin business no um snitches damn you know, uh, just thought we'd let you know, whatever. So within like 24 hours, you know, compliance was in touch with me at, at the, the bank and was like, you know, yeah, we have to shut down your business accounts. You can't, you know, it's, we have a policy against that or whatever. Um, yeah, so that was my fun run in with the law. So needless to say, I didn't return their calls anymore. <laughs> I didn't know I was bringing a badass on tonight <laughs> <laughs> when I invited you in. Yeah, Alan, the most badass guy. We're drinking monkey gin here. Not a big gin guy myself. Gin's gin's a drink for monkey hard 40, men. Monkey forty seven. <laughs> German gin. I, I'm yeah. I'm I'm a quasi salesman for monkey forty seven. This is uh, I I came across it in um, in Miami, and it's 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 crazy. It's like no other gin really, but you know. I have I have some food allergies and stuff, and I remember from when I got diagnosed with my food allergies, I'm, I'm seeing some of the same patterns with Monkey Forty Seven. So it's kind of funny when you have food allergies. What you realize after you figure out what your food allergies are is you realize that the things that you're the most allergic to are things that you like crave, like like <laughs> like heroin, like oh, like after the fact. I like I used to go through like a box of Devil Dogs like every day oh, almost. Yeah. You know, Devil Dogs are the chocolate like Devil food cake with cream in the middle. Mm-hmm. I used to shovel the, like down like a box a day, and after I like I was started getting sick and stuff, so going to the doctor, realized I had like some different food allergies, and I went back and looked at the Devil Dogs box. Like the first like one and two ingredients was like I was like deathly allergic to them. So I'm not poisoning you right now, am I? Well, so. I was gonna say I'm starting to have this kind of weird reaction. Like it seems like it's tied to the monkey. That like the next day, like I have like like my lip will swell up and stuff. Oh. I have like random like weird freaking symptoms. So I might tweet at you tomorrow and be like, "Look, <laughs> what you freaking did." And also, I kind of like crave it, which is really weird. Which I've never done with any kind of alcohol before. It's like if I run out of like my my stash is running low in the house, and I like, tell my wife like, "Oh shit, I gotta go buy like more monkey because the stuff it's hard to find." So. These these all point in a very bad direction that I might have to might have to cut the just, monkey off. Yeah, I don't uh, go. You know, downgrade I'm sorry to, to hear that. Hendrix or something. But but anyway, but it's it's great stuff. And it thanks for stuff. having it here. I mean, it's this traveled is, far uh, and wide to Bedford Ave to get it. It's not. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, it's you know, it's hard to it's hard to find this. You demand it. We we originally spoke in February. I think I think I, I can't believe you remembered. Uh huh. You know, this is this is, this is value add podcast service you know i i aim to please you know that's uh if i'm gonna bring you into this janky studio with, with uh speakers or excuse me a microphone set up on chairs the least i can do is indulge you with your favorite alcohol beverage it's 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 much appreciated i hope it doesn't uh lead to allergic reactions yeah tomorrow, but we'll yeah, see do you, have, do you have an EpiPen in the room? Would Not you? on me. Oh, okay. um, I'm sure there's one here. We work is definitely checking all the box there. So there's definitely <laughs> somewhere, something somewhere. Um, so, yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, so Bit Premier, um, you know, after the Homeland Security meeting, um, I kind of made a conscious effort to kind of keep uh, transactions. I, I, I mean, I kind of kept under $10,000 at that point because that was kind of the thin send threshold for reporting things. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to get into trouble for something that I was doing in my spare time. Um, and then that, so that ran its course. Uh, I sold it last year. I sold the domain off last year uh, to somebody I know. And, um, and so then after that, um, I, it was the Jamie Dimon thing came out with Bitcoin's a scam, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I, I made some kind of tweet in reference to the Jamie Dimon thing. And they like plopped my tweet right in the middle of the, like a fortune article of Jamie Dimon, like Alan Silbert, like senior vice president said this. So, you know, like 24 hours later, you know, the bank's like, you know, we need to uh, we have a meeting with, you know, human resources <laughs> in public relations. We need to, we need to talk to you. And like a true badass. They were, <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think I did anything wrong, but I, yeah, they, they, they were like, you know, you could be seen as a spokesperson for the bank. You can't allow to speak your mind. You can't like. They were like, you know, we see that this morning at six fifty, you were you were still tweeting about Bitcoin. And I was like, 
And I was like in my pajamas, like having coffee, like what, you know, and they're like, you just, you, you can't you know, any, no more public statements, 24 hours a day ever again. So, um, I kind of took that as my hint that it was time to move on to, to pivot into what I, what I really loved. So how's it feel to have, be free of the shackles? Uh, I mean, it's, I would, I mean, I know it's, I'm working my ass off for sure. Um, it's definitely startup life. You know, I brush my teeth at like, you know, 4 PM some days. I'm sorry to say, (laughs) (laughs) but, but, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't go back for all the money in the world really. Yeah. So that's, uh, again, like I said, once you're red pilled, there's no turning back. Um, yeah, really. Uh, and it's like, like you said, like that's a, that's a big theme here on the podcast is don't think people truly understand what money is. And once you do, finally, it takes time too. It took me years to really, you got to read history, you got to read economics, you got to try to put our current situation context of like a historical timeline. And it takes time to come to realizations like, oh, we, we fucked up money. And um, once you figure that out and then you see Bitcoin, it's like, all right, there's, this is like obviously better. There's, I can't believe everybody doesn't realize this yet, but, um, there's, a, there, there's like no going back to, I, I can never see myself going back to like crunching P and L sheets for a futures fund or anything like that. Um, yeah. It's, you know, and then money is one thing that I think, you know, 90% of people don't really fully understand. Yeah, and then there's and then there's Bitcoin, which really, you know, unfortunately has a very large technical hurdle. So, um, you know, it's it's hard, and um, and it's uh, it's kind of a barrier to entry, and it's you really, you know, like I feel like I'm fairly fairly well versed in Bitcoin, but it's like you're always there's always more to learn, mm-hmm. and um, you know, Grandma's never going to understand it really. Um, so it's going to have to get to the point where you know, it's like you use Bitcoin, but you don't even really realize it. Right. You know, just like much like you don't really know about the innards of a wire transfer and how it goes anywhere. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, you might have an interesting perspective on like Bitcoin's usage since you ran Bit Premier, like, and like you were saying, like people like to hodl it and use it as a store of value and people transact most likely if the price is very high. They're like, all right, we'll transact now. So like, what was that running like a like a, a website that took Bitcoin payments? Like, did you notice any trends in, in like the amount of transactions that were her- happening at certain points of time? Like, do you think Bitcoin is a transactional currency now? Or I mean, it, it took a while. I, I, I remember thinking that, um, like, I, th- I think, I think the, I think the, the, the villa in Bali, I think Bitcoin was around 600 and something dollars then. Um, but, but I do, I do remember thinking like, and and it was kind of very isolated. It was kind of an anomaly. It was a big deal though. Um, but after that, it was very slow. And I remember thinking like Bitcoin, will get to a thousand people start spending them Mm -hmm. and that didn't happen. Then I was like, all right, maybe Bitcoin will get to like 2,500 people start. And, you know, it kept going, going, going. Um, then I was like, yeah, people definitely just want to like hoard these things or they just transactions like this they want to do on their own or or whatever but i you know i mean i mean you know it's all it's all like psychology i mean i i spent a good amount of bitcoins on you know expedia and i used to go to bitcoin atms i think Mm -hmm. i think i my buddies a trip to vegas and it's like i don't even want to know what the exchange (laughs) rate was then and what you know what that would be now you know, about myself and Ice Watch, which now is, you know, would be like a Lambo. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I personally, I got to the point where I was like, all right, I, I like, you know, I, I did my my fair share for the ecosystem and I, I just, I can't spend it anymore. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like what you feel, like, you know, like right now you're at 64.33 and, um, you know, I feel like, you know, it's, we're, we're going up from here and, uh, you know, are hodlers good people? Is are they necessary? Do you think it's okay to hodl, or do you think uh, they're doing a network? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it, it, it's like. I mean, what you gonna? You can't like uh, lambast people for wanting to, you know, save money. It's yeah. It's just like you know. It's it, so I don't. I don't. Uh, I just don't understand a lot of like the the B cash argument, but it's it's. 
you know, we all we all want like Bitcoin. In a perfect world, Bitcoin would be everything, right? You know, we we want it to be everything. We want it to help poor people in sub-Saharan Africa. They're getting gouged by Western Union, and you want it to you know people to send back home to their relatives. You want it to buy coffee, <laughs> whatever. If you as we want, you know, in a perfect world, it'd be everything, but. Um, you know, I also personally don't believe in like the move fast and break things. Mm -hmm. And I believe, you know, you build off of a solid foundation and you, like I said before, you kind of, you know, maintain the confidence in the system. And, um, you know, so some things are just going to have to take time and come later. That's... One of, and one of them's not, not coffee really. So <laughs> exactly. no, that's one thing I wrote about yesterday in the newsletter. It's like, that's another theme on this podcast. We're meshing well here. I got a badass. We're meshing well. Because that's the other theme is patience. Like, like you said, like everybody wants everything out of the box. They want a world computer out of the box, like right away. Like this should be working right now. It should be able to do instant transactions at fee lists and be completely distributed right out of the box. But it's like, fuck you. That's not going to happen. It's going to take time. We're like 10 years into this. So yesterday, what I wrote about in particular was uh i don't know if you saw some dude in germany his name was matthias he did a demo of renting a bike with a lightning transaction um and basically walked up to the bike and unlocked it mm -hmm. using a lightning transaction and would have paid a microtransaction for as long as he wrote it he would, he would get charged or whatever uh that was like the first company that was going to get spun out of the dow when the dow was coming together slock it was the company that ran the dow and they were going to run something very similar and they were going to create like a whole new token uh, and create like a whole new ecosystem to do that. It's like, no, if you were patient and waited three years, you'd realize that Bitcoin infrastructure was getting to a point where base layer is secure enough, probably not s secure enough for the long run, but secure enough for this point in time to enable SegWit and then start uh, experimenting with Lightning Network, which is enabling these use cases that people wanted out of the box. It just so happens that it took... 10 years to get to this point to make it possible and so that's what we try to try to beat into the freaks on this podcast is low time preference it's going to take time and yeah it's uh i don't know that just these days people just have a need for instant gratification and they just they don't have the patience and but yeah it's, it's going to take time i mean this is uh, the, the whole the con it's an amazing concept uh, it's very complex you have to do it right and secure and um yeah i mean you know i can remember having a prodigy dial up account in like the early 90s or whatever and it was yeah a total piece of crap and there was no you know no kind of clean interface or anything it was like a message boards i think were the first things that, that came across like the, and this on prodigy and um you know, it, it, it'll get there, but yeah, it just, uh, it's, we're in early innings still. It drives me crazy the people that like treat it like it's a finished product. Like, like, <laughs> right. like Bitcoin has failed. It has officially failed. You know, it just hasn't made it. You know, it's ridiculous. It's just, you know, it's really, it's really still in early innings. Um, it's surprising it's gotten this far this quickly, I would say, actually. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I first started, uh, you know, learning about it and stuff. I used to go to like meetups in the DC area, and I and I and I, th I think our I think our main concern then was like the government's just going to come in and just shut down. It'll be just done with. Mm -hmm. You know, before we fully understood kind of everything, the decentralized nature and everything, it's kind of impossible for the government to shut down. But um, um, I mean, in that, in that respect, it's in this country, it's it's really not that bad. I mean, you know, it's. It's a grueling process, but um, you know, I, th I think we'll we'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, other countries will be easier than the U.S. for sure, but um, you know, we're definitely past the, the point of no return. Um, you know, I, some maximalists and stuff will totally shun any kind of institutional involvement, and it kind of depends where you are in the maximalist spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like it because it just kind of further entrenches us into the, you know, there's no turning back whatsoever. Right. Um, it's, yeah. in, it's inevitable too, right? Like the system is supposed to be used by all. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless institutions don't like making money. <laughs> right. I mean, they're good. They're going to get involved. It's just, just it's what, you know, they're in the business to make money. Um, so they'll find some way to, to leverage it. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's come a long way.
Yes, it might be the first time the, that retail is able to front run the banks. So as they're waiting for their custody solutions and institutional uh, caliber products, I guess you could say. Yeah. It's a time for the little guy to get in. So if you freaks are, are still dollar cost averaging in, keep it up. Actually, I don't know. This is not investment advice. We're not investment advice. That's, that's right. Um, Tales from the Crypt is not an investment <laughs> advisor. <laughs> what, uh, what are you most excited about these days? I mean, I think that and definitely not the price. Yeah. Although this kind of feels like that uh, that bull market when it you know it went went to eleven hundred or whatever it was, and then we I remember wallowing around you know two hundred dollars for a while, and yeah. it was pretty grueling. So you know, and who, and who knows? I mean, things can change quickly. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm excited most excited about now, I think, is just uh, with the price relatively quiet. Um, you know, it's just everybody's building stuff, but, you know, which is good. Uh, it's, uh, there's less distraction with the price and people can build, um, and, you know, and more and more infrastructure and more and more, you know, there's more developers that are getting involved, um, which, which, you know, which I think is awesome. You definitely need a huge bullpen of developers to get involved here. I don't think a lot of these companies have not, you know, done enough to get involved with code development. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, like complaining about how things aren't going their way and, you know, right. It's a problem. You know, if you don't like it, then don't, you know, get, get involved, invest in, you know, put some developers into, into the process. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of like companies like chain code block stream, they're paying, paying for development and it seems like other people are getting into it. I don't know. Um, I don't know how to approach this subject. Let's just do it abruptly. Like last summer, your brother obviously was in the middle of the whole fork wars with Segwit 2X and the New York agreement. And Hold on. T time for more monkey. Alan's <laughs> <laughs> making himself get, a get, new get drink the, Get the EpiPen ready. Uh, I'm totally joking. Um, and it seemed like a little bit, of, it was a house divided a little bit last summer. It seemed like you were in the, the main like laissez fair, like let's stay out of it, let, let everything take its course. And your brother, it seemed like your brother... Barry seemed like he, there was a, an impetus needed to move things forward and, and went for it and mm -hmm. didn't I play out as he saw fit over the summer. But yeah, I think, um, you know, he definitely, um, you know, I think he, he went into it with the best of intentions, uh, you know, and I know, and I spoke to him, you know, before that time period and, um, I think his, um, his attitude then was, you know, let's, you know, let's just get Segwit activated no matter what. Um, and I think things kind of just like went off the rails. Um, uh, you know, personally, I think uh, that, you know, but, you know, first of all, you know, at the time, you know, I just, I was just a Monday morning quarterback. I mean, you know, whatever. I was just doing my day job and just, you know, being an asshole on Twitter. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't need to manage a portfolio of a hundred companies mm -hmm. um, like he does. Um, you know, and I think, you know, DCG has been pretty crucial in the space with investing money into the space and yes, everything. Yeah, so, um, you know, a few, a few different CEOs of well-known companies who I'll decline to name, I think, or, um, I just think are a negative energy in the space. And, um, uh, I think kind of forced, uh, like an ultimatum, like we have to have a, you know, round table agreement and move on or we're going to, you know, force a hard fork or something. And, you know, meanwhile, said people, here we are a year later, and after, you know, things were so awful, we needed to move forward, we need to do something, our customers are ailing, you know, they're, they haven't activated SegWit still. So that just tells you. You have an ongoing uh, Twitter, Twitter tweet, 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 uh, tweet quote thread going on. Uh, calling out the specific summary. I'm not going to call them out either. You yeah. can go find them on Alan's. Twitter. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I stopped my jihad for a while. <laughs> I, I have, yeah, I know. Just some, uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's the way Bit, uh, Bitcoin sign guy described uh, Bitcoin. It's, a, it's a called a digital jihad. <laughs> <laughs> the What's that guy doing these days? Is he in the space, like working in the space? Bitcoin he's, sign he's guy? He's in the background. He's, uh, he's, he's working on, on some sovereignty enabling projects. 
I don't like. I don't know if I'm allowed to disclose. Like Bitcoin sign guy is very. He's mysterious. on. He's your. He's on like your Twitter like background, right? Yeah. He, oh, on Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, the yeah. banner. He's, the banner. Yeah. he's a very, like uh, a very eloquent twenty three year old. One of the most uh, famous memes of all, of all Bitcoin time. Uh, I would I would argue probably the most famous just because of the juxtaposition of buy Bitcoin, Janet Yellen, and the ticker being. Uh, Fed is opposed yeah, to, yeah. to I, being you audited. Can't, you can't time that much better than that. He really. didn't even know like the ticker was going to be there. It was just so, it was serendipitous and, <laughs> and incredible for yeah, for it's, the it's memes. Pretty, it's pretty ballsy. Yeah, very Indeed. ballsy. Twenty three uh, years old, right? Twenty two at the time, I would assume. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for doing that, Bitcoin sign guy. Uh, we can't ha- wait to yeah, have you back on. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of like top three memes like that, like Hoddle. Which is the st- if you I, when I go back and read it I still just like laugh my ass <laughs> off it's so funny they're like good story dude he's <laughs> just like hodlebottle dot com wasted you can find it o h d l b o d l dot com you can find the original bitcoin talk dot org post where hodl was started um, shout out Andrew DeSantis for that that redirect uh, URL there um, no but it's funny there's more memes pop the NPC meme have you been following that at all what's that. It's a, it's a new meme that's popping up. It's basically calling out PC culture and uh, vapid mainstream media news. And it's basically just like a blank face uh, that is used to basically ridicule somebody saying they don't have any individual thoughts and they just follow <laughs> the, the tropes that are, that are given to them. Um, that's been blowing up on regular Twitter and is seeping into crypto Twitter this week. And it's just hilarious how memes propagate and how they actually do affect the conversation. Like last summer, like no two X, uh, like that was a meme for a while. Uh, UASF was a meme for a while. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, people think memes are running the world right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think it's only going to get crazier from here. I think I saw somebody tweet something like, "What if like the meme revolution just leads us to the singularity it, uh, <laughs> quicker than we, quicker than we expect? It's going to rip a hole in the universe." Uh, another huge topic around here, memes. Um, well, you know, I mean, mainstream media, it's, it's really amazing to me, like, you know, Bitcoin, however many years in we are, eight? Almost ten. Day, yeah, it's... um. Ten and fifteen days will be the white paper, ten-year anniversary. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, it's it, almost ten years in, and it's like me, mainstream media really hasn't learned that much. It's really, it's really quite amazing. Um, yeah, just like the, the the clicks for views and the rush to post something shock. It's just it's totally ruined the news. It's that's it's absolutely awful. Um, I don't. I can't even watch it anymore. I don't. I can't tell you the last time I watched CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, any of them. Don't you love the CNBC Fast Money counter oh. counter indicator? It's a great as one. As soon as they short, or as soon as they teach you how to buy so an altcoin, <laughs> then you know it's the ex- absolute all time high. And you probably so. <laughs> We're going to be sitting on ninety five percent losses at some point, and Jeb McCaleb is going to be laughing at you. <laughs> it's it's just, I mean, it's it's just like an uphill battle. It's just you know. Yeah, it's it's like there's a Bitcoin already has like a technical hurdle, then you got to deal with all all of these like numbskulls that, you know, put out information that, you know, the the uh, populace believes that this is the energy NBC. It must be right. The I energy mean, means you know. uh, that's like a big one to co- overcome. Like, yeah, the, the yeah, fund. yeah. I know. It's there's a lot of misunderstanding around that, and people literally cannot get the concept of this energy w- would otherwise just go untapped or unused and you can liquidate it into self-sovereign money and there is value in that and it's not wasted energy and it's not really a burden on climate change in the long run unless you're using coal but you're finding most people are using hydroelectric or geothermal for these these uh, operations and remote areas specifically yeah and um yeah, it's uh, it's a constant battle fighting the FUD in the mainstream, and it's, I don't know, I think things are are shifting to like an online narrative. I think people are starting to just from, I don't want to say apathy, yeah, apathy. Like they've been been through the ringer so many times. I think with the election cycles, particularly now, it's like every two years you're just focused on election after election. It's just like oh, I'm fucking tired. When are things going to change? Yeah, just wait for wait for a happen? month from now. You're gonna want to like poke your eyes out. Oh my god. 
right? What is it, November 8th, midterms? Yeah, I'm getting close here. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't vote. I get, I get yelled at for not voting. It's your civic duty. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating. South Park said it best. It's voting. You're always voting between a douchebag and a turd sandwich. Totally. <laughs> I don't know who was who in the last election. Or I had a douchebag, right? turd sandwich. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, my, the, um, the, the first job I got out of college um, was for, it was like a 20-person company at the time. It was healthcare lending. The, the CEO of that company is actually running, he, he's my congressman now um, in Maryland. He's actually running for president in 2020. Um, but, and he, and he's absolutely incredible, a very smart guy, blue collar roots, um, you know, self-made, uh, self-made, you know, multimillionaire, but he's, he's like too middle of the road mm-hmm. in which I, which I'm, I'm totally like, um, I'm pretty middle of the road kind of guy, but he just whole have no success because he's just not polarized enough. And that's just not, you know, what wins elections in this country. So, right. You literally have to drive your narrative to one side of the of the pole yeah and you got you have to be crazier than moderate it doesn't work so <laughs> yeah which which uh I mean, you know he's it's john delaney i mean he's he's awesome i you know i'll i'll try to vote for him but i, I don't think he, he doesn't have, he doesn't have a chance is what is what i hear so we'll just end up with uh you know a turd sandwich or, or a douchebag <laughs> is you know as um yeah right it's the time you know <sighs> But it's it just seems like it's getting to a point with politics in particular. Um, we're just not fast enough for the world we live in, you know. And it doesn't represent, at a granular level at least, uh, it doesn't do a good job of representing the people at this point. Um, I would argue. I'm complete. Like I'm going to admit, I'm 27 years old. I'm completely disenchanted by the whole process. Yeah. I was a senior in high school in 2008, and literally. That's when my consciousness flipped on to like paying attention to that shit and literally watching everything unfold the last 10 years. I'm like, how could I ever put any confidence into this type of system? Yeah. I thought your generation was like the, we definitely have to vote generation. And now it was the, like, why the fuck will we even <laughs> participate in this? That's at least my mindset is. So that's why I focus on Bitcoin so much. I'm like this, you could literally build a better system around the sound money potentially in the future it might take a while it might take decades but let's start doing it right well it's yeah it's it's very aligned with the times in that uh you know people want to ha- have power over their own money have control um and um yeah it's it, it goes well with the current narrative and in internet international economics which, you know, and God knows, like nothing was learned with, with Lehman Brothers, so we might be in a much worse situation than we were ten years ago. Pretty soon, right. uh, nothing learned whatsoever. And I think you could probably speak speak to the condition of the the financial system uh, with your experience at Capital One in particular. So I worked for uh, a valuation firm uh, that did third party valuations for private equity and. Um, private equity and venture firms, but we only, we only worked with middle market companies. So I did a a lot of job doing like DCF uh, analysis for middle market debt. And it's just like, you're just working to get that EBITDA ratio to a certain point. And you're just working with the balance sheet at a certain point to try and manipulate that EBITDA ratio to a certain. And the EBITDA ratio, it's, it's creeped back up, right? This is what happens. And it's, you know, everything cycles. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, I think we're kind of coming to the, you know, I think the, the credit cycle is again, kind of exhausting itself and you kind of see things kind of starting to stretch out the EBITDA multiples, uh, cov light loans. I can I was seeing start coming back into the picture again. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, we're basically, you know, you, you just have less triggers with which to like, uh, you know, call default or, or, you know. Uh, call a loan or something so it's um yeah it's just you know it's the same shit over again and you know it, we're the same position we're pre layman except for that you know now global debt is <laughs> twice what it was then <laughs> so you know it's it could have the potential to be ridiculously ugly uh, you know what do you think happens if it is ridiculously ugly do you think 
the traditional financial system rises from the ashes this time, or do you think there is a... No, they just they like print their way out of it, I guess. But I'd do you see. think they can again? Like, how long can they keep printing themselves out I know, out that's, the, that's the big question, is it? It's like, it's like the only way out of it. It's, like, you know... It, literally, like... That's how you, you know... They cannot that's, raise... That's the, how you make your debt less onerous, is just, you know, print more currency, and... Um, can you right. do that forever? Yeah, I don't know what the tipping point is for like the U.S. dollar. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I think if if like the U.S. dollar turns into if it turns into like hyperinflation, like Venezuela or something, then we're like in Mad Max. Like things are pretty fucked up. Yeah, start. Acquiring. I mean, it's just the world reserve currency. Uh, you know. Yeah. Well, that's another theme here. We've been following the. Uh, the uh, story of China beginning to to value their oil futures contracts in Renminbi and Yuan uh, to try to under undercut the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. So if you look at it, Russia, China, uh, and even some European countries have been stockpiling gold for the last decade, and then they're starting to negotiate these oil contracts, which will erode the dollar's dominance as the petro reserve, basically, and so those those themes are slowly but surely happening. And um, you know, reserve currencies only have a finite uh, lifespan usually. Yeah, usually um, like a hundred years or yeah, seventy and to one. And then they shift. So you know, and so then you know, then it also points to Bitcoin being you know just like this non correlated asset class, mm-hmm. um, where you know. We'll have some gold, all right? Take some of your gold allocation, put it into Bitcoin. Um, you know, it really doesn't move like anything else. Uh, you know, 5% of gold gets allocated into Bitcoin, and you're like Bitcoin 25,000 or something, so who knows? Um, but yeah, that's uh, well, there's like this, there's like this, uh, there's this fine line, you know. You know, Bitcoin, I think, will excel when, like, global misery kind of increases and, like, things are falling apart. But then if you go, if you move to, like, Mad Max level catastrophe, then, you know, it's a crap people, have to, people have to, like, liquidate everything for, like, food, you know, canned and goods and uh, ammo <laughs> and water. Yeah. You know, and we'll be, like, siphoning gas out of cars and shit like that. See, I don't think it'll ever get Mad Max bad. <laughs> um just because I think, I just think we're smart enough as a species to be like, all right, we can we can figure this out. I just think there need there is. I just think the world, filled with seven billion people right now, I would gander to say that six point nine 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 billion are just completely complacent right now and just going through life accepting the system in which they're born to into. And most of them, most of us, don't realize that. Uh, the system is incredibly fragile right now, and uh, I think that's why we're in Bitcoin. Is at least why I'm, and I said this earlier, but I do think we can transition. And this will be a better system, and that's why I tend to focus my energy on this as opposed to the what quote unquote traditional world. I feel like Bitcoin is a bit like the Matrix, where you're just living in this parallel universe that nobody understands or even knows is like going on. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it has this effect of really like drawing you in and getting like so excited. Um, and I, I guess I, I don't know. It, it's just uh, it's it. I don't know if it's because it's so genius in its concept that it really just like casts off most things that get attack get, you know, that, that attack it. Um, you know, it's cutting edge like fintech, so it's exciting. You know, and like I said before, just like you know, people like have control of your money is just like it's surprisingly like unique like mm-hmm. in today's world there's always somebody involved yeah you know the money you know the money your cash isn't sitting in the bank vault it's <laughs> it's it's, it's gone database. it's elsewhere yeah um you know and if there's like a national bank run like you know we're like all all screwed all your money is going to be gone so um so yeah all right so you and your brother are very ambitious very just don't call us the Winkle Vi or the, the, Winkle the, Vi. the, the Sil Vi or something. Like uh, they're uh, the Winkle Vi. Speaking of the Winkle Vi, the Gemini USD uh, stablecoin, quote unquote stablecoin. It was twenty percent off its peg at some point earlier today, so that's interesting. The stablecoin phenomenon right now is blowing my mind. 
um, that's a subject for, for another day. I'm, I'm, I'm personally of the opinion that all this tether, it's all, it's all just fought and bullshit. I, you know. It doesn't, like, number one, stable coins are only stable until they're not stable. So they're, like, susceptible to black swan events. Like, just know that going in. And if you're going to do a stable coin, do it the way Tether's doing. One dollar equals one Tether. Yeah. The dollar is the U.S. is the reserve currency of the world, excuse me. And if you're going to create a stable coin, might as well just keep it simple, stupid. Hey, one Tether equals one dollar. Don't try to create these algorithmic central banks. That uh, now you're going to, I mean, you'll have a, there's a Gemini coin, Goldman coin, JP True Morgan coin, coin. Circle's coming out with one. You know, um, that's the other thing. Like what these stable coins don't realize is, I mean, the the urge to launch them is obviously so strong right now that we're seeing, I think, seven have been launched in the last six months. But you idiots don't realize that you're going to eat away at the stableness of your stable coin. Like adding more stable coins makes the stable coins before it inherently more instable, unstable, excuse me. Um, and as more stable coins come in to the market, it's going to make the whole concept of a stable coin unstable just because you're not going to be able to keep a peg across that many quote unquote stable coins. Yes. And I hear that more, more are coming indeed. Well, gird your loins for more, <laughs> <laughs> more stable coins. They're coming. It's the next ICO craze. Oh man. Uh, it's, uh, it's crazy the space. It's never boring, even during the depths of the yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely not. It's always something. There's always something. If we're if we're just you know lulled into boredom by the price, then well, there's probably some kind of meme or Jim BTC. <laughs> <laughs> Jim BTC. That's a good reference. <laughs> well, well, now what we're seeing with this bear market is you're having uh, Bitcoiners go after each other. There's a. Uh, People calling yeah. out maximalists. People are like, "That's right." Everybody's so freaking bored. They have right. to attack each Start other. Ripping each other's eyes. I, you know, that's why Noriel Rabini was great. I, it's, you know, everybody uh, just attacked him and forced all together. It was uh, so unifying. What are your thoughts on Noriel? Uh, he's he's got a book coming out. I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah. he's got a freaking book. It's it's got to be. I mean, you know, I I mean, you know, I, I think he likes he likes being like the contra. You know, the contra crypto. You know, crazy expert. Um, but he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Like he was referencing immeasurable Guinea coefficients, and he was totally wrong about. He he conflated mining pools with individual mining. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he definitely doesn't understand a lot of the the economics of mining and everything. I think that uh, you know I'll, I'll give him like you know okay shit coins. Yeah, okay, I'll agree with him. You mm-hmm. know, ninety percent of them are just total trash. Um, private blockchains yeah blo- well, he was blo- actually pumping blockchain. private blockchain he was he i thought he was, it was the- he was pumping private blockchains i'm sorry he was wrong about that too oh i, th- I thought he was saying that blockchain not bitcoin is a joke I no he was saying it can create actual efficiencies so uh, uh yeah uh and then uh van valkenberg had to call him out and say you could do that with a mysql database like you don't need that yeah well he you know Peter's a, he's a he's a good person to have up there as as the uh, as the rebuttal witness. Yeah, he was. No, he, thank he, God he was he, there. He's smart as shit. Yeah. Well, that goes. Yeah. I'm telling you, he's, got, he's he's a book. Well, that goes back book to, announcement. It goes back to my disdain with the government earlier. Like, they're not even capable of finding somebody who actually knows what they're talking about to come testify to them about a subject that's very important. Well, Professor Bitcoin has been a, you know, he's, he's, been, he's been a, quote, expert witness for a long time. So what that he, kind of shows you. What does he consider himself, like in the traditional Doom, Professor Doom or something like that? Nuro Robini is Professor. Yeah. yeah he's, oh, he's you're talking about Professor Amen. Doom. Professor Bitcoin is oh, uh, Mark Williams, Mark Williams who yes. called for $10 Bitcoin. So he's, yeah. you know, 65,000% out of the money or whatever. So. Yeah. There's been so many detractors over the years. It's hard to keep count. Uh, yeah, I know. There's, there's a few. A few have, you know, have, have been implanted into our, our memories forever. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's important to have people like Pierre Rochard and Michael Goldstein uh, keeping track of these guys with Bitcoin obituaries and uh, the skeptics list, things like that. Um, yeah, it's been a fascinating uh, ten years. Um, yeah, it's come a long way. How much more time do you have? Uh, as much time as you have. I got plenty of time. What uh, what are you into outside of Bitcoin? Oh. 
Uh, you know, kids traveling, mm-hmm. not spending bitcoins anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, I probably should be spending some, but um, so so yeah, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time with my current venture with INX. Um, you know, being a fully regulated exchange definitely you know it takes a lot of time. So this is something we could probably dive on. Like, what would you change? with the reg- regulatory structure to make it easier and practical uh, for easier for businesses and practical from like a regulator's perspective where like you're sort of checking every box and yeah, you know, I mean with that, without a doubt, you, you need some kind of uniform regulations in the, in the U S so, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's what like people, you know, like coin center has been fighting for and people like that. It's uh, you know, it's, you know, why not go to the EU and, you know, dealing with them is so much easier. You have like one universal license and, you know, you're done. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, here you deal with, you know, federal laws in like 50 states and three territories and whatever. And, um, you know, and then it's interesting. It's, you know, there's a wide disparity of like kind of like comments you get back from each state. Some states will be, you know, if with, if, you know, we have to go through a blue sky process because, uh you know, if you want to you want to sell a token into into each state, you register in each state. So, you know, some states are like, "Yep, we're good," <laughs> <laughs> and some states, you know, just bring up the most like just ridiculous questions whatsoever. So, um, and, yeah, I mean, it's the, the, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a Democrat. I'm a registered Democrat. And the, the, these times are trying for me as a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm because, yeah, I, I just like the, the, the Democratic states are the worst. It's just it's, really? it's just really tough. So, so Democrats out there, yeah, if you, if you want to keep me, just start got to be more reasonable. Start ripping off the red tape, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, it's it's hard. It's, it's so it's it's hard. that's that's the main thing. It's just, you know, yeah, yeah. It's you just need a, a uniform construct in this country to to deal with regulations. So, um, and it's such a shit show. Is it a commodity? Is it a currency? Is it? Uh, yeah, you need you need a lot of regulatory clarity. And then we're getting we're getting there. I, I I think we're getting there. Um, you know, and, and it's hard for Bitcoin businesses or crypto businesses in this country. All all the ancillary businesses are also kind of sitting and waiting for regulatory clarity. So, you know, dealing with banks, dealing with insurance, dealing with, everything moves like very, very slow. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a couple banking relationships in the States, you know, it took months to set up, you know, in between they changed their banking applications, what they needed and this and that, um, you know, insurance, uh, is, is a total pain. It, it's, it, it'll get there, but it's just, it's just very painful right now. And um, unfortunately, like regulatory clarity will kind of, you know, lead things. So we have to wait for regulators. Yeah. It's like, that's the other thing I worry about though. Like are the regular, like after seeing like the testimonies last week, like hopefully they're capable of making reasonable regulations and, I, you know, it's it's funny to me, like these, like the hearings, like the the, um, the government officials are just like all over the place. And, you know, of course, they have to be knowledgeable on like a thousand different topics. You know, next week they'll have a hearing on like, you know, farming or, you know, mm-hmm. biofuels, you know, God knows what. But, yeah, you know, it's like, it's funny because like the, the hearings, like half of them will like kind of balance. Like I got another hearing next door, you know, and they kind of balance out, bounce back. You know, it's just like... Um, it's all a road show. It, it, it's like a, it's optics. I would say it's it, it's it's just it's not you know not a way to get anything done quickly. No. Um, yeah. So it's I, I guess a necessary evil. I don't know. Some would say that you just you just you know Bitcoin could survive without any of this crap, and you just you know. Yeah. It's what, sometimes I wish I just went in like a fifteen year coma and just woke up and <laughs> didn't have to worry about all the noise between now and then. Um, we're just we're all very anxious to see Bitcoin succeed, and well, that's a that's a all funny thing. Just take time, and you know, that's the funny thing. We're all anxious to see it succeed. It is succeeding. That's what we have to like remind ourselves of. Like it yeah, is yeah. It's still producing blocks every ten, roughly ten minutes, and giving out twelve and a half Bitcoin right now, and people are transacting on it. Yes, it might not be uh, where it was from a price perspective. Actually, it, it, it's higher than it was this time last year. 
that's a funny thing. Like it was only above ten thousand dollars for like forty days, maybe. But like that is what is stuck in our mind uh, for something that's been around for ten years for thirty five hundred days almost. I just I just remember I remember 40. that time. It was just like total <laughs> elation, but you were like, "This is gonna come crashing but at the, the hell down." It, at the same time, there was like moments during the run where I was like, "Maybe this is it. Maybe like it never goes back down. Maybe we go straight to like ten million dollars." It was it's such a fun time. Everybody on Twitter is like, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000. To the moon, <laughs> but uh, no, that's that's actually been a funny, not funny. It's actually been a interesting thing dealing with as we've been coming down. Is and maybe it's something we could talk about in length. Is like I was, I've been the Bitcoin advocate to all my friends and family, and obviously at Barstool, I was the Bitcoin uh, connoisseur, if you will. And during these like euphoric moments, like yeah, I'm like Bitcoin. I'm like I think Bitcoin is going to be successful, but at the same time, I was like, do not go all in Bitcoin. Like buy a little bit at a time, like. Do not buy a bunch right now. It's like like ten to twelve thousand dollars, and tell them to stay away from shit coins. And during that forty days, they all oh, ten, twenty, hundred x. Uh, and they're like, "You're telling us to buy Bitcoin," and then like it's all failing. So like the fallout of of being an advocate during times of euphoria, and then still being an advocate after the crash, and trying to convince the people that you're convincing during uh, high times that it's still worthwhile. It's been uh, an arduous task, but there are some people, as there always have been throughout the cycles of Bitcoin, that stick around. And, and I think the, uh, the people that stuck through, that got into Bitcoin and crypto sort of in the mania of last year and have stuck through are in a better position than we were in like 2013, 2014, I would say. Because there's a lot more access to information and quality information. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've been... Uh my high school friends is like nine of us. We actually all still keep in touch. We have like a perpetual text stream. Mm -hmm. I've been telling these idiots to buy it since like 35 bucks. Mm -hmm. I think between the eight of them, they've probably bought like a couple bitcoins. (laughs) You know, I told them like, you know, 30 bucks, 40, 50, a hundred, you know, 500, you know, they're they're like, no, it's got too much. 600. It's got too much. You know, a thousand. No, it's done. You know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I've always told people just, you know, you, you put in, just put in what you can afford to put in. Don't freaking second mortgage your house. That's asinine. Um, but um, yeah, it, at least people, you know, but people would look at me like a total alien like five years ago. Now it's like you're slightly less of a crazy person. Slightly less. <laughs> but what I've been getting more recently is like, ha, huh, you must have lost a bunch of money. Like, uh, are you okay? How's Bitcoin doing? Are you okay? <laughs> well, you, see, you know, we're so, we're so like immersed in everything. Like my friends are all like, I like, uh, it seems like crypto is dead. Like I, I haven't even heard about it in like a year. Is there, you know, is Bitcoin still like, you know, doing okay? You know, what's going, you know, that's what people are like that aren't connected in the, we're, we're just so like, you know, immersed in the space and stuff. So, and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's like as strong as it's ever been, really. I mean, to be honest, like in pretty much any metric, it's it's doing great. You know, it's the best it's ever been, except for price. Um, but like even with price, though, like it was above where it is now for maybe 50 days. Yeah. I, yeah out, of a, out, of a, <laughs> out of a six, 6,500 day lifespan, yeah. like 50 of like less than one. Less than one percent, less than a tenth of a percent, where it was above. Was it ten? I can't do math right now. This gin is getting me all drunk. I, I, yeah, it's um, you got to be careful for the monkey, you know. Yeah, it's actually funny. Uh, the monkey not make me an angry drum. Very happy right now. Very happy. I it's usually... all those botanicals. It's like the same thing that you know <laughs> that I'll need an epipen for makes it taste good. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's I uh, I think it, it's. I, I feel that things have gone in a upward trajectory, a positive place ever since inception, really. Um, you know, with some, you know, notable speed bumps in the way, like Mount Gox and stuff. But, you know, I mean, money keeps coming in the space. It's, I like to I like to see the more more developers coming in, the more developer activity. And, um, and you just, you have, like the Wall Street brain drain, it's happening it keeps continuing you're seeing like a crypto brain drain now like wall street like taking crypto people and bring them into their firm like 
dude from Coinbase just went to Bact and is working for them now. So yeah, like yeah. You're you're seeing the war for the talent. You just gave up on the on the crypto kitties. <laughs> you, wanted some, you wanted something more serious oh to work God. on. I had a friend send me. I haven't been on Coinbase in a while. We are we uh, we deleted all the other apps. We're on Cash App now. Official sponsor of the pod. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Cash App. Absolutely, big, big fan of Cash App as well. Um, tonight's sponsor. Uh, we we did an ad read for them in the beginning, uh, pre-recorded. But uh, they uh, somebody sent me screenshots of Coinbase's interface now. And it's a complete shitcoin casino. They have literally like any like you can get price charts on any coin you want. They they're not offering any coin, but they just they just added zero X today. Yeah, um, yeah, I saw that. Which is a token that does not have any value. Like it literally, I'm pretty sure the creators came out and said this will never accrue value. It is a token that has the, the highest velocity ever, so it really should not have value. Um, but yeah, I they I don't know. They, they make some curious decisions over there. But um, you know, I mean, what, I mean, what I'll give to them is that they were absolutely the on ramp of choice for you know many many uh individuals you know retail people that's where i bought most of my bitcoin yeah i don't know if i should say that whatever the gin's got me feeling feeling confident right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, i mean you know i mean re- you know they they made it uh you know an easy digestible way to, to invest in and, yeah. and uh you know that's that's where they, where they excelled and then you know kind of along the way they've kind of <laughs> All the Ripple people are up in arms because they're like never going to get added. <laughs> but um, you know, I bought my first Bitcoin. It was it was a total shit show. It was uh, you know 2013. I used to have to. And at first, I was very tentative, so I was buying like little tiny amounts of it at a time. So I used to go walk from work to the CVS drugstore. Pick up the red MoneyGram phone, and they're like, you, pick no. up, you talk to an operator. You know, it was total. It was this is a total. Um, it's it's so funny. You so know, you talk to the operator, be like, I want to send you know two hundred dollars, and they'd be like, you know, blah 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 blah. And they'd be like, okay, go to the cashier. So you hang up the red phone. You walk to the cashier. You give them two hundred dollars in cash. So then MoneyGram would send the money to Bit Instant, which was the Shram for years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it might have been. Roger Ver in Enterprise, and then Bit Instant would send it to Gox, and then I'd buy the bitcoins on Gox, and then I would transfer it to I don't remember what wallet I used at the time. It might have been blockchain. Sorry to say, and then um, yeah, that that was the whole process. It was like the red phone cashier, Bit Instant, Gox. It was it was like a total catastrophe. So so yeah. So Coinbase is a ginormous improvement over that, right? People don't think Bitcoin's successful. It met, like that's how hard it was to get only five no, years ago. I'll tell you. Five six years. The ago. red phone. The red, the red phone, phone. Going was... to a CVS. Hey, maybe that's a marketable. Hey, I bought my Bitcoin at CVS. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, and you know, I was, I was like, "There's no way this fucking money's going to go anywhere." I, I was like, "It's definitely MoneyGram's going to send it. I'll never see this money again." But, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, I sold my Gox YubiKey, and um, I, you know, true OG, true OG badass we got sitting across from me right now. Um, no, nah, it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy reminiscing on those days. Like, what, what, what else about the early days was like crazy to you? Um, well, I mean, there's. I remember the first conference I went to was in San Jose. I think it was 2013. Um, you know, in like a shitty conference center. The Winkle Vi were the key keynote speakers. Uh, I can remember. I think it was Butterfly Labs, Coinbase. Oh, shit. I, there's a lot of them aren't aren't even in existence anymore. You know, it was like 99.999 percent white. Mm-hmm. You know, 20 to 30 year olds. Um, so you know we've, we've we've come a long way since then, um, you know. And now the conferences are just totally like overwhelming. They're not even this, worth it anymore. Uh, you know, there's there's, like, there's, there's a million just like ICOs just like throwing their shit up against the wall to see if it sticks. Um, you know, like the conferences are of of limited, you know, limited value. I mean, you you go because you you talk to people. That's why you go. Yeah, that's what. Uh, the uh oh you were at uh hodl hodl and that was at hodl hodl that was some some of my my inx peeps were there oh really yeah 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 so they and they 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 love the content there that was it's it's really quality yeah i've been to 
two conferences in my life, that being one of them. That was very high quality. And I went just because I wanted, it was like, one work was going to pay for it. And then two, I uh, uh, just wanted to meet like Eastern European Bitcoiners that I've been talking to, or like European Bitcoiners in general. I've been talking to online for years. and Yeah, I was sorry to actually, I was sorry to miss that one. I had to be, so I think I had to be in Israel like the next day or something. But um, but yeah, they put a good, I mean, what's a, why why Latvia? Why they pick Latvia? I don't know. Hoddle Hoddle, the host of the, uh, the conference, that's where they're, that's where they're located, but hey, not, not easy to get to Latvia from no, the from DC area. Not easy from New York either. It was like a sixteen-hour travel day. It was pretty terrible. I'm you just, like pack up all your microphones and shit in the I suitcase. Did. Yeah, I traveled light. I brought one duffel bag. It was like three days. Brought like one pair of pants, three different shirts. <laughs> and that's all. One little pa- crypto <laughs> <Exactly>. attire. <laughs> you know, I can't. I can't spend my hodl stash on clothes. Yeah, I got two pairs of pants, a few t-shirts. That's all you need. I have my Cash App Bitcoin sweatshirt from the oh, inaugural. I never got one of those. Yeah, they, they, they definitely. It was a real thing. They went out. I, yeah, I got one. Sponsor Cash App. This is a side to you. I'm gonna need one of those sweatshirts. I didn't hop on it early enough, but. I'll, I'll sell. I'll sell you mine. Uh, they, they're definitely it's a limited edition. <laughs> they, they don't exist anymore. That's like a supreme drop. Yeah, you're gonna be able to resell that uh, on a second market mm-hmm. for yeah for for quite I'll sell that in my Gox uh, Yubikey <laughs> on eBay. Yeah, cash apps. You know. Yeah, uh, quali- quality, very quality high app. quality, and I'm interested to see what they. And they're in like a unique position with Square. Like, imagine if they could form fit Bitcoin functionalities onto their their entire pos system community like anybody that's using their pos system you can i I mean i'm completely imagining this right now but i imagine one day in the future with a software update of square software you can just get complete bitcoin functionalities maybe hopefully they're experimenting with lightning network or liquid side chains or something like that and we'll slowly but surely build the the things that make bitcoin ubiquitous and actually useful yeah We'll get there. Uh, you'll be using it. You won't even know it. Right? Square is... Uh, at some point, you'll... Uh, that'll, that'll be the case. Very bullish on Square and Bitcoin. Um, Square is getting totally punished in the stock market. I don't know what the... I've been last, right. last I, I, I bought it the second that they announced the, the cash app. And yeah. The CFO left. The CFO, I know. Unannounced uh, this week. I know. Anytime a CFO leaves, it's like... People run for the freaking hills. Yeah, what's going like on? Like it must be, a, you know, accounting scandals and shit. But hope not it, to see that. Nah, I, it it seems really overdone. Yeah, but then again, I you know, I bought I bought some Square stock today. Actually, I don't know if it's a conflict of interest since they're a sponsor, but whatever. <laughs> We're a startup <laughs> podcast here. Well, you're not privy to any, you know, insider information. No. Yeah, so yeah. this you know, there's no there's no conflicts here. No. Anyone yeah, I, I think I think that the it's been overdone. Well, it's come from like a hundred down to like in the seventies. It's crazy. I bought it like seventy five today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, I am a I'm a square stockholder. It was a little hot. It was a little hot this year too. It was a nice little correction. Yeah, yeah. Maybe buy some fun. Um where are we at here? Fifteen. I think I have about fifteen minutes left. Uh <sighs> So is there anything, so you said you're a Democrat, like, with, I'm not trying to get political or anything, but, like, is there anything, like, ideologically, like, you were describing sound money earlier, like, that, that you think attracts you to Bitcoin, other than, like, sound money? Are you about, like, disrupting the state, or are you, obviously, you're a little disgruntled with the regulations they have to jump through for, <laughs> for <laughs> INX, but do you fall in line with, like, the ana, ana, anarcho-capitalist like mentality at all or um you know i think i i i, I think f- uh, first and foremost i think that people should you know have the ability to be independent and have control over their own money really mm-hmm. um you know i think you know as soon as people go off any kind of you know gold standard or peg with fiat currency it just you know you it's the, the the pull to print more money is just um, you know governments can't resist and so for individuals to be able to opt out of that and you know have some kind of predictable math based 
you know, non-inflationary currency is, you know, is just very important. Um, you know, I think, you know, governments have global, the global finance system has made it easy for Bitcoin because the systems are so antiquated and ridiculous that, you know, it should, it's, it shouldn't take you like multiple days to be sending money to, you know, international countries. It sh you shouldn't be getting gouged 15 to 20%. You shouldn't, you know, it's, um, you shouldn't be at the whim of a company to censor you based on just like where you live. Um, so, um, so, uh, you know, I'm not like a crazy, you know, anarchist, super maximalist. Um, but you know, I think all these things are, are, are important. You're a fan of self sovereignty and yeah. individuality at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. No, so, it's no, it's weird. It's something like growing up in Philly, probably one of the most liberal cities in the world. Uh, yeah, I'm in a very liberal bubble in the DC area for sure. So. Yeah, it's coming up. I definitely, definitely had those left leaning tendencies like throughout high school and college. I went to college in Chicago, which is another left leaning city. But then. Uh, I don't know. There is there is something about Bitcoin that makes you inherently, at least from a monetary perspective, conservative. Where it's like, yeah, the sound money makes sense. But again, going back to what you said, like transitioning from a system where the central bankers are just throwing darts at the wall with interest rates and monetary policy to one where it's math based. That's why I think people don't understand the beauty of Bitcoin. Is like you can literally predict what's going to happen on a block by block basis, and you have that certainty of knowing the supply schedule and knowing what the uh, s the float supply of Bitcoin at any point in time is going to be. And that lets you plan ahead in the future with a certain amount of certainty uh, that does not exist right now. And I think, so how do we help people come to this realization that this is important? That's sort of my biggest question that I'm trying to crack with the podcast and the newsletter. That's what I try to do every day. It's just introduce these ideas little by little with less than 250 words or an hour and a half podcast. But it seems like more work needs to be done. Like we need to get through to people on a, on a bigger scale and cast a bigger net, if you will, you know? Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And you know, it's like I said before, it's, it's like, there's a big, it's, the, the technical hurdle is hard. You really have to like dumb it down. It's not because people are dumb, but it's just because, you know, people, people have like a limited attention span. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, once you get into some of the granularities of Bitcoin with the you know, hash power mining and, um, you know, nonces and this and that, it's, it's just, it just, people just can't digest it. So, um, and, and that's why I think it's like, it's, it's really positive that it's just, it's just in the, in the end, it'll just be the rails that people like operate on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they don't necessarily need to 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 know the to know the, the dirty the, the nitty gritty about it about how it works. Um, but but yeah, you know, it's uh, I don't know. The next the next few years will be interesting. Right. We'll see how the global governments kind of work their way out of this one. I I don't, I don't really know. It's uh. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Things are flaring up on the geopolitical stage. It's stuff with the Saudi uh, journalist. Um, yeah, it's going to be like a World War One kind of... Right? Um, like a Franz Ferdinand. You know, who thing? knows? Uh, you know, I, I'm definitely getting more and more conspiracy theorists and skeptical and cynical as I get older that, you know, we're all, we'll run to the end of... We'll get to the end of our economic cycle and then governments will be like, okay, it's time for a war, <laughs> you know? Right? It's real. I, I, yeah. I, I just get more and more cynical as I get older about, you know, governments and then you know their inner dealings and how they deal with this kind of stuff. I mean, they're incentivized to do it, right? Like they only keep power if, I mean, our government in particular keeps power if it keeps the petrodollar as strong as it is, and that's why this Saudi journalist situation puts us in a very precarious situation. Where it's like, yeah, you can't really defend that. Uh, it's like one of these things that you could you, you could really imagine could spin out into like a total uh, like a total nightmare right like uh, like overnight like a total like you know geopolitical nightmare just oh, like, I, I think in already, like two seconds I think it's happening okay. yeah the last thing I saw is that someone said that they chopped his body up and you know some Turkish uh, officials said that that was, that was the last thing well the, that's the big thing like Turkey 
Turkey was spying on Saudi Arabia but can't admit it. So they know everything that happened. They just can't they can't like say exactly what happened. They're like, Yeah, we were spying on these guys and they chopped him up and put him in like his body parts in like separate suitcases and carried him out like in parts. <laughs> He walked into that building as a whole living being and walked out and didn't walk out. He was carried out in separate parts and suitcases. Like with his, what? I, so this guy, he was was he like a Saudi like detractor, like loudmouth in, in the journalism about? I, I'm not positive. I, I, I would imagine he was yeah, very. I would imagine he's at least semi-critical of the government. Yeah, and they something. weren't happy. Um, that's and like I, Saudi Arabia. I, I don't know. Uh, meanwhile, we you know yeah, it's like. We we have all these allies for our own, you know. We have our own motivations in this country, whether it's for oil or for, you know. It's just like it's completely hypocritical. You have like the Me Too movement going on, and then Saudi Arabia is our biggest ally in right. The Middle Women East. can like finally drive there. Yeah, you know, it's like that's the that's the large accomplishment. Women can drive a car now. Right. And people don't get that nuance either. It's like, hey, like the U.S. is rah rah, we're perfect, but it's like uh, we, have, we have many we have many questionable alliances, and yeah, yeah. it's yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, yeah, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, that's an ongoing story. I was actually I was on the bike today, listening and watching a YouTube video on my phone, and had MSNBC was on the TV in the background. I saw they they literally talked about that for like two hours straight, and. I did not pay attention to any of it, but uh, uh, the the Reddit and 4chan news is saying this dude like walked in there, they torched him, cut him up, and walked out with him That's in, so in separate crazy. bags. Yeah. Um, Are you still on Reddit? You still on R Bitcoin? No, I don't go on R Bitcoin or or any of that. I go on Parcel Reddit actually. That's like my favorite Reddit page for some reason. And then. Uh, uh, a couple others. I'm a, I'm big Twitter. Twitter is my matrix. That's, yeah, yeah. I'm I pump a, into my I'm tweet the deck. Same. I, I pop into this tweet deck and I feel like I. Am I mean, you gotta love tweet. You gotta love tweet deck. I mean, if again, I I mean, you freaks know this out there. It's my favorite app. If you're consuming information, especially in crypto, uh, create list, create a tweet deck, and get it up there. Yeah, I mean, they you know, then you can just create a new list that's like you know, if you want to know about. You want to know you about know. Square Stock right now? Bam. Right yeah. there. What's it doing? There you go. The investors sell shares of Square. I don't know about that. That's not good. <laughs> we got a Donald Trump doing a 2020 election exclusive right now. Uh, the Flyers. I mean, come on. Yeah, you just want a cup. How's it feel? <laughs> I, I I was literally uh, I, I was literally crying. Were you? I, I, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think the Flyers are closer club. <laughs> I'll take the Super Bowl. I'm I mean, from Philly, so I'll take the Eagles won the Super Bowl. I'll take that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, which was incredible. I was actually it, happy for Ovi. I'm a big Ovi fan. It's just, it's just, it's been you know I've, I've been I'm in my 40s. It's been it's been a long run in DC in sports, mm-hmm. and it's just, it's the same story every year. It's just like you know you get to the first round, you know rah rah, and then you look like, you know you just totally shit the bed. So yeah, this was just. Absolutely, absolutely incredible. To get over I, the I, I just like, I, and it, it's like funny. I'd like, ask me like a year ago, I'd be like, you know, it's just, it's just a freaking game, you know, whatever, just sports. But I don't know, it just, it's magical. It, it was absolutely unbelievable. You know, my son's like so into it, and like, you know, we, just every game is like so exciting. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy thing. It was Obi, very exciting. Ovi had himself a summer after getting that, after getting that cup. He uh, summer of no shirt for uh, for Obi. He followed in the the footsteps. Of I mean, that was the fu- that was the best Stanley Cup celebration <laughs> right? week. I feel like they it never definitely ended. had to dry out. Uh, they definitely all went to like the Betty Ford Clinic. I mean, is it like that in every city that has a, the cup? I mean, they were they were like off the hook. It was crazy. I can't imagine. I actually lived in Chicago. And they won the cup three times when I lived there. I lived there for five years. They won the cup three times. They had some pretty crazy celebrations. I think I wasn't there for the Cubs win last year, but I think or two years ago. But I think that was an epic celebration. If the Flyers ever win another cup, Philly people think like the Eagles uh, Super Bowl celebration was big. Like Flyers are actually low key like the biggest Philly sport, it, like the biggest hardcore Philly fan sport in Philly. And if they ever win another cup, it's going to be pretty epic. I don't think it's going to happen this year, but yeah, the, the NFC East is pretty. Uh pretty pathetic with the Redskins, you know, 
When the Redskins are in oh, first, the, 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 the first Eagles place. game. I'm talking about the Flyers. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. The Flyers ever win another Stanley Cup, uh, the city will burn down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you never know. Never know. If, the, if a Washington team can win a championship, anything is possible. What are your thoughts on Dan Snyder? Big fan? Holy shit. <laughs> God, well, he is the freaking worst. <laughs> he's, the, he is the worst. He's, he's the problem. He is the problem he, for you he guys. Is, he is the problem. I'm very happy he's still there. Um, I'm, we'll be happy until... Until he, I'll be very sad when he leaves. Yeah, it's a funny phenomenon in DC. It's like as soon as you leave the team and go elsewhere, you just you suddenly flourish and become a good athlete. It's it's uh, <laughs> yeah, um, like Kirk Cousins is like Kirk Cousins kicking, in Minnesota kicking right? some ass, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, it's you know I, I haven't been to a game in years. It's totally hideous in DC. You got to fucking go in the beltway and all this traffic it's total mess like parking is like 50 bucks if you don't want to like walk like two miles and you know and then dan snyder gouges you for you know whatever he can so yeah it's 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 all all stuff my my couch is so much better right yeah with beers that aren't 15 bucks so we're actually hosting an eagles watch party this week so i gotta prepare for that who they playing the panthers should be a good game Oh, oh yeah i think we play dallas yeah um Man, we're like an hour and a half in here. It's been, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, been fun, man. It's, it's been fun. Uh, it's great to meet people in person in the Bitcoin space. You know, I I, right. I meet people at like conferences and stuff. They're like, dude, I'm like, you know, X Y Z crypto, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, holy shit! Yeah. It's nice to put a face to a name. <laughs> Wasn't expecting you to be so ugly. <laughs> It's it's funny this existence. You know, my wife thinks it's crazy because I, like uh, you know, I just interact with people that I've never met before that I'm like tight with. It's beautiful though, right? That's the one thing. Was, that was like Riga. I met people in Eastern Europe. I talked to. It was like we've been friends forever, and you immediately get it, or not get it, but you have this immediate connection. I think that's that's the one thing is like you don't have to. There's no like icebreakers. You both know that you have a common. Yeah, common, it's, it's exciting to all yeah. be. It's like. It's like hanging with the Eagles fans. You now you're just all <laughs> right. Exactly. They're all yeah, the same DC team, Philly man. People here being very uh, <laughs> civil. Um, before we hop out of here, is there anything like any parting note you want to imbue to the freaks out there? And like from your experience, uh, whether it be building INX, building Bit Premier, being in the space for five years, like any advice for the freaks out there? Um, you know, just learn as much as you can. Um, not from mainstream media, for sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of good resources out there in the space. There's a lot of good journalists like Aaron Von Wordham. Bitcoin Magazine generally has quality stuff. Um, so I would, you know, if you're a noob, just stay away from mainstream media because their accuracy rate is just like absolutely awful. And, um, you know, reach out to people like me. I'm, I'm happy to respond to people on Twitter and stuff. If you want to DM me and, you know, ask me any questions or anything. There's a lot of good resources out there. And, um yeah, just like learn as much as you can. Um, you know, it's early days. We have a long way to go. That's, I think that's a good reminder is it is still early days. So people think it's too expensive now. It's binary people. It's either worth zero or a lot of money. And it's not a lot of money yet. Maybe in some people's mind it is, but not as much as it can be. Um, Alan, thank you for coming through. Hey, it's, um, it's great being here, man. It's great I, to meet you. It's great to meet you as well. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and the Monkey 47 gin. Thank you. I'm not angry. I appreciate it. I'm not angry. This is good. (laughs) I'm telling you. This is good. This is the magic gin, man. It's the magic. Yeah, you freaks. It's great to be back in the studio doing interviews. Uh, We've got Rabbit Hole Recap, obviously, every week. I think we're going to do that Monday nights now. If you're liking this, please subscribe, rate, share, review, unsubscribe, resubscribe. Spread the word. Um... Peace and love.